introduce new uh, cells or new pathways or anything. We're just going to look at how the immune system works in several different settings, okay? And we're gonna sort of work through this where, where there are immune responses that we want and then immune responses that we don't want and then look at different versions of that. You know, if, if you have autoimmunity, that's an immune response to self that we don't want. If you have allergy, that's an immune response to something foreign that we don't want. But on the other hand, vaccination is an immune response to something foreign that we do want. And so we're just going to look at how the immune system plays out in all of these different, different roles, okay? All right, so we're gonna start with vaccination because <clears throat> this is really one of the most important um, parts of immunology is how do you get an immune response without, hopefully without getting disease? And is that successful? And then we'll start off with just what are the different kinds of vaccinations uh, and immunizations. And then we'll end up with a discussion of, of what are the drawbacks of vaccination and sort of uh, some analysis of public views of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's the problem, right? We live in a world where there are lots of things that are trying to infect us. And that includes the simplest infectious agents are prions. They're misfolded proteins that direct the misfolding of other of themselves. There are viruses that are just genetic material with a few proteins that get in and hijack our resources and their bacteria. And then we sort of get more and more complex, <clears throat> right? As we get bigger in genome size, they get more complex in terms of how do they operate? What are their uh, immune evasion strategies? And with that, it's more and more difficult to generate a vaccine. First of all, we don't have vaccines against prion diseases or none that are efficacious in, in any case. So that's a problem because that's, that would be essentially you uh, vaccinating against a self protein and that's never a good idea, or rarely a good idea. But we have lots of vaccines against viruses. We have a fair number of vaccines against bacteria. There's a few against fungi, but as you get down to protozoa and helminths and parasites, we don't have a lot of good vaccines for those because they're more complex and it's harder to make a vaccine. So why is that? Well, let's first talk about the impact for vaccines, okay? When you think about worldwide deaths, about 25% and climbing are due, to, um, are due to infectious diseases. That's 25% of all deaths in the world. And it's climbing because we're actually getting better at, at, uh, at um, treating other diseases, but there's lots of diseases that we don't have vaccines for, and so this infectious diseases are, are still running wild. That's clearly seen with COVID-19, where we don't yet have an effective vaccine. And so we're having 100,000, uh, in the US alone, we're having 100,000 new infections and 1,000 deaths a day right now. So that it's, it's quite a big problem. Vaccines remain the most effective strategy for preventing deaths and, and diseases from our disease from infectious agents. And that's often seen in, in sort of, okay, what do we have, what, what numbers did we have before vaccines existed and then after? And so you have to go back to the 1900s. Remember Ehrlich, Kitaburo, uh, Shibasaburo, Kitasato, Von Bering, all of those guys really were at the turn of the 1900s where they started to recognize that you could manipulate the immune system. And that, those were, led to the development of the very first vaccines, okay? One of the first was pertussis. We don't really think of pertussis as a big problem, but in the US, there were, there were 200,000 cases that year, right? Per year, this is cases per year. Um, measles, there was half a million per year. And then you look at, now that we have effective vaccines, how many cases do we have? First of all, remember the population of the US is much bigger than it was in 1900, but the number of actual infections is still relatively small. You went from 500,000 to less than 100, okay? So vaccines are very effective. And then on the left, I have how much of, how much of a reduction 
have we seen in the past 100 years or 120 years? So smallpox, it's 100%. We don't see diphtheria infections anymore. We don't see polio. Measles is close to 100%. Rubella is close to 100%. Uh, you have other diseases, right? In Haemophilus and influenza that are basically going to 100% efficiency. There are still others like pertussis or um, other, there's a number of that are, are not on here that are less effective, but, but vaccines are tremendously effective against infectious diseases, or at least it can be. So we have to start with where, is, where did immunization start? And it might surprise you that immunization started far before we, we really think about this. And uh, the first real account of, of immunization is really from Chandragupta Maurya in India, who is a very famous emperor or king of India. And, and there's lots of legends about it, right? So the one legend is that, that he uh, was being fed from his advisor very small doses of poison so that he could build up immunity so that he, if somebody tried to assassinate him by poisoning, that he would already be immune to it, okay? So this is very astute observation. Um, I, they didn't really know about antibodies or cellular immunity. But so the legend goes that he shared his food though with his pregnant wife who was not immune and she collapsed and died. And uh, they immediately performed a C-section and a single drop of the poison landed on the unborn child result, resulting in the blue dot on his forehead. And this is the origin of the Bindi or the Bindu that this is where that idea came from. And this also gave rise to the legend of the Vishakanyas, Vishakanyas, which are his private poisonous female assassins that could either stab you or if you got their blood on you, that would kill you as well. Now, this is a nice story, but if you go back, this really does have a lot of hallmarks of immunization. You're immunizing against a poison. It's not an infectious disease per se, but it's, it is a, it, at least in practice, it does happen. Now, what happens is that now snake handlers are doing this as well. Okay, this is very common. Even in the United States, snake handlers will intentionally inject themselves with small amounts of snake venom so that then they will build up immunity to it, okay? And this works. I don't advise it. <clears throat> Many people have died from it, from injecting themselves with too much, but it can work. And that practice is called Mithridatism. And so Mithridates later sort of took on the same idea. Mithridates was a, a famous ancient Greek um, who his father got killed by poisoning, so he developed this irrational fear of poisoning. And there, again, are lots of stories about him, or lots of legends, but essentially he, the legend goes that he lived in the wilderness where he regularly ingested sublethal doses of poisons in order to try and develop immunity. And then when he came back, he, uh, he was immune and he survived several assassination attempts. But then when his armies were defeated, he tried to kill himself, but he did it by trying to poison himself, which he was already immune. And so instead of poisoning himself, he had to have his bodyguard impale him. Okay. But Mithridatism is really the act of ingesting sublethal doses of venoms or poison to, to be immunized. And so this, there's a number of other examples in history. These are two of the earliest. And it's not effective against all toxins, right? It doesn't work against cyanide, but it does work against protein toxins like venoms or things from plants. And so this is something that, again, is done by some zoo workers, uh, especially those who work with venomous snakes or venomous insects. It's done by circus performers who work, work with those. It's a very efficient way of immunizing yourself against uh, venoms. However, still, again, very dangerous to do. That really leads us, leads us back to this guy, right? Paul Ehrlich, who in, in my mind is really the, the leader of immunology at the turn of the century. We're talking 115 years ago. 
And he, was, he basically showed this experimentally where he immunized mice with sublethal doses of a protein toxin. So these are toxins, uh, one is ricin, there's another version of that. These are very potent toxins. Ricin was used on the Japanese subway uh, roughly 20 years ago and killed some people, okay? So it's a very potent toxin. But he showed that if you immunized mice with a low dose of ricin, they're predicted against high doses of ricin, okay? So this is essentially proving that, that Chandragupta and, and Mithridates were correct. You can immunize against protein toxins. But what he also showed is if you immunize with a different toxin, in this case, abrin, abrin is, is a different protein, and it's, but it is a poison. Those mice are protected against abrin, but they're not protected against ricin. If you immunize against ricin, you have an immune response against that, but you're not protected against abrin, okay? And then there were other parts of the experiments. He showed that immunity could be transferred from mothers or from blood. But this is where the whole idea of antibodies or anticorpers developed, okay? So we've covered this experiment before, but I'm just tying it back to the very, the, the long-term history of immunization. So this is, pervasive in culture, okay? This is from the Chronicles of Riddick. Um, and he essentially, I don't know if you're fans of Vin Diesel, but he plays a sort of fugitive who's trying to escape from a planet. And the problem is that he's got to get across these uh, venomous mud uh, creatures. And so what he does is he captures a small one and injects in its venom into him over a period of days so that he can become immune to it. And so then he's immune to the venom and then he makes it across and, and is able to escape. Now, in reality, in the movie, it takes him four days, a couple of days. In reality, it would take him years to build up that kind of immunity, but it does rely, it does recapitulate the actual phenomenon of mithridatism or injecting yourself with a poison to become immune to it. Okay, so Vin Diesel, perhaps unknowingly uh, recapitulated Nobel Prize winning work of Ehrlich and others. So the question is, what is immunization doing, okay? And I, it's, it's key to remember that immunization in this case, it has to be against something that has a protein. Why? Because you need something to show to the T cells. They only present peptides, okay? <clears throat> so we come back to where we left off at the, before the last exam, which is, what does an immune response look like? Well, immunization is not really affecting a long-term innate response. During immunization, you do get innate cells, they're responding, they're telling the adaptive immune system, yes, you should do something. But then you can see that it goes away, <clears throat> right here. The immune response turns off once the vaccine or the pathogen or the, vex, the uh, protein is gone, there's nothing for the immune system to see at that point, or nothing for the innate immune system to see. But what do we have? Well, we, we go through the acute phase, but really immunity is over here, okay? This is what we're concerned about. You have pre-existing antibodies, which against these toxins are very good at neutralizing them and preventing them from having their effect. You also have memory cell, B cells and T cells. And so those provide much faster response during the second exposure, okay? Now, in reality, if you're immunizing against a toxin or a, a venom, really the thing that's most important are the antibodies. Because if it gets in and you're, you're relying on these guys to respond, that's too slow. The toxin will go and have its effect and, and you won't be protected. Okay, so really during a, a re-exposure to the same antigen, you're looking at the antibody response. So what happens? Well, okay, if we look at the antibody response, first of all, there's pre-existing antibodies that neutralizes toxins coming in. But because you have pre-existing memory and uh, T cells and B cells, can see that those also go up. As the memory B cells go up, so does the antibody response. And now this higher affinity, it's, it's uh, more 
correctly isotype switch to the right isotypes, in this case, IgG. And so continuous exposure is gonna keep driving this higher and higher and higher with each exposure. So you build up immunity, you can give higher and higher doses and get higher and higher antibody responses till eventually just have enough antibodies that you could control any amount that you, that you get. Okay, so that's really, there's nothing new here. This is just what a normal immune response looks like, but we're applying it to immunity to a toxin. Okay, so there's a couple terms that I do want you to, to look at here. <clears throat> so there's a question in the chat room, does this work with bees? And the answer is yes. It absolutely can work with bee venom, um, but people who are, are predisposed to be allergic get the opposite effect. But um, we will cover allergies in a subsequent lecture, including desensitization, which is the intentional immunization with the allergen to generate a tolerizing response. Okay. And so, yeah, and there is, there's a response there, which is correct. Okay. Okay, so getting back to the terminology. Um, so you stop sharing your screen, just so you know. Stop sharing my screen. How on earth did that happen? All right. Okay, perfect, thank you. Good. Okay, so a vaccine is something that you, well, some, preparation that you intended to produce an immune response. Sorry, there's, I must have deleted this before I uploaded. Okay, so vaccine is a biological preparation intended to produce an immune response. It's, it's uh, something that you're going to inject. Vaccination is the process of administering a vaccine. That's slightly different than immunization and we'll go through why that's different. Okay, immunization is the process of generating a protective immune response. Now, the reason that those are two different terms is because not all vaccines work. And so you can, give, you can vaccinate without actually immunizing, right? It means the vaccine doesn't work. You can also immunize without giving a vaccine and that's called passive immunization. So immunization is, is generating protective immune response. Vaccination, vaccination is actually injecting something. Why am that a big difference? Because people often mix those up. In current administration is also mixing that up where they think vaccination and immunization are the same thing. They're not. Okay, so passive immunization is when you transfer cells or antibodies from one individual to another. And we'll talk about where that, that does happen. Active immunization is where you're injecting a vaccine or stimulating an individual's immune system to generate protective immunity. Okay, so they're two slightly different things and we'll go over the, each of those. And we'll start with passive immunization. Remember from Ehrlich's experiments, you could transfer immunity from the mother's milk or from the blood of one mouse to another. Uh, von Behring and, and Kitasato could show that they could transfer immunity from immunized horses to humans. So that's really the basis of passive immune immunization, but it happens all the time. Okay, so the first is the placental transfer of maternal antibodies to the developing fetus. Okay, and so the maternal, uh, in the maternal blood, there are antibodies that are the result of vaccination or previous infections. And the mother can pass those to the placenta, through the placenta to uh, through barrier cells, which basically grab onto that uh, antibody, transfer it to the other side and release it. Okay, so this is the neonatal FC receptor. And this is uh, a way that you're providing short-term immunity to, um, to infants. Okay, and this is the main mechanism, maternal um, antibody transfer in humans. In other species, it is breast milk. Humans also do transfer of, of antibodies in breast milk. But in this case, in the neonate or the neonatal intestinal lumen, the neonatal FC receptor 
is going to bind to antibodies in from the maternal milk and transfer those through the uh, through the intestinal epithelia to the bloodstream. Okay, and so you can. This is why nursing mothers are providing short-term immunity to their offspring. And often when you have, uh, when those mothers stop breast, uh, breastfeeding, then you lose, the infant loses immunity and you often see diseases uh, start to poke up, okay? So both happen in both humans and rodents. This is the main mechanism in rodents, um, mainly because they have a much shorter gestational time, but they both happen. But we can do this artificially too, okay? So one of the first immunizations was against tetanus um, as well as diphtheria. And the first guys to do this were von Behring and, and Shibasaburo Kizasato, right? That then this was in the early 1900s where they would immunize horses against tetanus. Tetan, you know, they would basically use a heat inactivated tetanus and inject that into horses. And then they could take the serum from horses or cows that they've immunized and transfer that into humans. Now, does that sound dangerous? Yes. Why? Because your immune system recognizes the horse antibodies as foreign. And so you could get very serious serum sickness, which could be lethal. Um, and then the problem is you could only do it once. Because if that patient got infected and you tried to give horse serum again, you're actually making a big response against the horse serum proteins and that would usually kill the patient. So it's a one shot deal, but it was actually very successful for the time. It was dangerous, but, but successful. What was the point of putting it in the horse and taking the horse antibodies instead of just giving them directly like the, um, the heated up, like why didn't they just heat shock or whatever the, antibody and give it directly to the humans? Why did they use the horse? Well, because the horse could get sick. Often the horses would get sick and die. And so they couldn't just give it to patients. Um, and plus what they were treating were patients that were already infected. So they couldn't just take this and give it to somebody who's already infected because they've already got tetanus. What they're trying to do is treat somebody who has got disease currently and so they're injecting horse serum that, from a horse that survived. Does that make sense? They're not, yeah, they're not they wouldn't go out and vaccinate the entire population. They're only doing this to treat people who have the disease. Okay. So what do we have this? What do we use this for? Well, there are several of these, right? I think the most famous recent one was treatment of Ebola virus with the ZMAB antibodies, which were partially developed at ASU. So these were doctors who went to uh, Eastern, or sorry, Western Africa and uh, contracted Ebola. They flew them back to Grady Hospital in Atlanta and treated them with antibodies. And so this still does work. It still is a treatment, but if you look at where, where are these used? Well, they're used either prophylactically in people who have a very high likelihood of, of becoming infected, or they're used post-exposure prophylaxis or post-exposure treatment to try and, and keep disease at a minimum for somebody who's already gotten exposed. Now, for example, it's a clostridium. If you're exposed to, to uh, botulism, right? Clostridium botulinum, then you're treating somebody who's already been poisoned, trying to reduce the, the disease. This, this is also true for hepatitis B, for HIV, for rabies, for vaccinia virus, for varicella zoster, um, and, and also for Ebola. Okay, so there's lots of examples where we still do this but they're really only in people who have been exposed or are likely to be exposed. And so the likely to be exposed are usually people who are going, undergoing organ transplant and have resurgence of, or likely to have resurgence of virus or 
are being exposed. So you know, there are a number of these where you're looking at somebody who's immune compromised and saying, well, we're just gonna treat you for this short time in order to prevent you from getting disease. Uh, hey, Dr. Blattman. Yes. I think you might wanna stop and explain prophylaxis for people who haven't taken the HIV class. I don't think most of us would have run into that word elsewhere. Okay, so prophylaxis is just trying to prevent something. That's all it really means, okay? So you could say post-exposure treatment equally well. Um, prophylaxis is really a term of saying, we're, can we protect you from disease? And so post-exposure means after you've seen something, pre-exposure means you're, you're likely to see something. So prophylaxis typically means pre-exposure. Post-exposure prophylaxis means after you got exposed to it. Okay, so in Arizona, we often do this for venoms, right? Somebody comes to the hospital with a snake bite or a scorpion sting or a black widow spider bite, they can get antibodies against those, okay? So here in the state, we have scorpions, we have rattlesnakes, we have black widows. So there's a number of things that we can treat you in the hospital for. Why? So for some things like rattlesnakes, that's very important. If you don't get it, your blood coagulates and you, and you die. Most of the time we don't treat for scorpion or black widow um, venoms because they're typically not poisonous. But other things like if you're um, in Florida or other parts of the world and have coral snakes, then it's a very serious, you do have to treat with this. So why don't we just do this all the time? Well, I put on the left the bill here. And if you can all zoom down, what is the bill? One treatment is very expensive. If you wonder why we just don't do this for all diseases, because it costs an inordinate amount of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you don't have insurance, that can ruin your life, right? So this is very important that we reserve it just for those people who have actually been exposed and we can, we can save their, it has to be life-saving sort of treatment. What makes that drug so expensive? Because it says pharmacy $83,000. Yes, and that is because it is a protein it's very expensive to grow antibodies. You essentially have to, you start with immunizing a rabbit, you take its B cells, you fuse them, you know, we talked about generating monoclonal antibodies. Then you have to grow those up, purify it in an, in an FDA approved way, which is essentially a clean facility. So it gets very expensive to do that. Plus they're drug companies and they wanna make money. But passive immunization treatments are very expensive worldwide. It's not necessarily just driving up the prices because of our health system. Okay, so you, that's- Dr. Blackman? Yes. Say you get bit by a, a rattlesnake and you're given this uh, antibody treatment, are you still gonna develop your own antibodies against the venom? Yes, likely. It, it does, and then nobody really knows how much it inhibits your endogenous response, but there's still enough of that protein that you're still gonna make a response to it. Okay, so that's antibody passive transfer, okay? But you can also do cellular passive immunization. And this is done, this is typically called um, T-cell adoptive therapy, in which you take a tumor from, from a patient with cancer you isolate the T cells from that cancer, and then you grow them up in tissue culture to high numbers, billions of cells, and then you infuse those back into a patient, okay? And when you're doing that, you're really transferring T cells, but you haven't immunized that patient. You're just transferring T cells into the, into the patient. There's not a normally occurring version of this, like there's not maternal transfer of T cells, right? And so it's really just an artificial way. And you can do this back into the original patient that you got the tumor from, or you can do it into another patient that has the same tumor. Um, we typically now are doing uh, alloreactive T cells that are from unrelated donors and they are very potent and, and can be disease causing. You can also modify the T cells to have chimeric antigen receptors to 
recognize things they wouldn't normally recognize. So one version of that is to make a T cell receptor that actually has the antibody part of an anti uh, B cell marker and use that to treat B cell lymphomas. And that actually works pretty well. But there's a downside to passive immunization. And it's really all I want you to know about T cell passive immunization is you're just transferring in a bunch of T cells that you've either modified or, or done something to, but you've, you've grown them up to large numbers. Here's the problem. It doesn't last, right? Particularly for T cell responses, transferring T cells, uh, they're active for a couple of days. They don't um, really last long. The other downside, right, for that T cell response, it's even more expensive than antibody transfers. A typical T cell adoptive therapy costs about a million bucks, okay? It's very expensive because it's very labor intensive and you have to be monitored because T cells can kill you. If you're transferring antibodies, antibodies are, are proteins and so they have a half-life and they're eventually gonna degrade in serum. So there's no long-term benefit. You need, if you're going to treat regularly to actually, if you're gonna maintain immunity, you have to keep doing it. In, and additionally, even transfer of human derived products can result in serum sickness because we all have slight genetic differences, sometimes called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Those can be uh, seen as foreign. And so you get a limited number of transfers before even with human products, you're gonna build immunity to the serum or the transfer products from the donor. Now this is different than active immunization, which we'll cover next. Active immunization is where you're injecting a vaccine right, to get a response, and then you give booster shots to build that response up higher and eventually get to some level, threshold level of immunity. Now this is, is for the long-term better because you don't have to replace this. It doesn't need to be replenished. And it really just requires a few booster, booster shots to get that immunity up to where it needs to be. So <laughs> active immunization also has a very long history, okay? With the exception of, you know, sort of these rulers who did it to, to protect themselves from poisoning, the history of immunization really starts with the Chinese in probably the early 10th century. Um, but some would say there is evidence from even earlier than that in some of the Egyptian um, uh, pharaohs who had smallpox. But anyways, the, the, the way this worked is it was really only done by uh, sort of uh, rural doctors in China. And it, they, were, they all had different strategies, but there were elaborate things where you take the scabs from somebody who had smallpox and you would put it in sunlight. And if it was a certain temperature, it needed a certain amount of sunlight exposure. And it was thought that this sort of inactivates the scabs a little bit. And then they would take those and blow those, uh, the, the ground up bits of scabs into the noses of children as a way of immunizing against smallpox. Okay, so this is really the first program, but it wasn't widespread. This was really, sort of rural, unaccepted medicine. And that changed, if you remember from our very first lectures when Emperor Kangxi came to power and he, his father died of smallpox and his older brothers had died of smallpox. So he came to power because of smallpox and he mandated variolation for the entire, uh, the entire country. That changed things, okay, and so this sort of spread throughout, uh, throughout Asia. And then Lady Mary Montague, we remember, who was the wife of the ambassador to Turkey, observed this, did it to her own kids, and then brought that back to Europe. Because she was in a very high powered family, was able to bring that to, um, to England or the British Empire. And that was then mandated, yes, we have to very late against everybody. Then eventually Cotton Mather, right, who were, we're more familiar with brought this to North America. And it was not very long, just within a few years. If you think about it, this is before we were even a country, we were doing this. 
Okay, so this is how variolation spread. It really was just a cottage industry or a cottage thing where a few people did it, but it, it, it really was, once it was mandated, then it spread throughout the world in just a few short years. So when we talk about vaccines, we're gonna start with variolation, which is a low dose of a wild type pathogen. And that is the most efficacious form of vaccine. It basically is you're giving a low dose of the actual um, you know, thing that's in trying to infect you. And that will then um, give you the proper kind of response you need for that exact infection. Downside of it, well, when, people, when these uh, doctors would go to villages and vaccinate against smallpox, or sorry, variolate against smallpox, if 5% of the kids didn't die, they had to repeat the whole process because they didn't do a good job. Okay, so it was very dangerous. I'm talking about, you know, if you do 100 kids, five are gonna be dead. That's how they knew that they did a good job. And so that really moved us to closely related pathogens that are not as likely to kill us. And so we'll go from variolation to vaccination, which is taking uh, cowpox or variola virus and immunizing against smallpox. And we've talked about that already. And then as we've gotten better, really these are more, excuse me, uh, these are more modern strategies. We've taken pathogens and attenuated, intentionally made them less good at replicating so that they're less dangerous. But notice what's happening. As the, the danger goes down, so does the efficacy. Okay, that's because as you get farther and farther away from the actual real thing, it doesn't work as well. And so we have recombinant vectors expressing proteins from this. You can have just the killed pathogen, or you can just express proteins from the pathogen. Now, they, there are examples of all of these different vaccines. However, as you get farther, as I said, you get farther and farther away from the actual pathogen that, that is likely to kill you, the immune response gets confused. It doesn't really respond the same way. And so we'll talk about the differences in these different vaccine strategies. Okay, and we'll start with variolation. This is inoculation with a small dose of the wild type pathogen. And this was done until the mid 70s. And in particular, in Afghanistan or some rural areas of the, of the Middle East, there were still variolators, these guys that would go to a village and they would, um, they would be paid to inoculate all the kids with scabs from smallpox patients. Okay, so they, they would grind this up and this is an actual one of the sort of, uh, variolator mallets. They would grind it up on here and then rub this in this needle into the ground up uh, scabs and then stab you in the arm with that. Oops. Okay, so patients were the source of the material to go to the next village. And there's, it's really interesting to listen to this. Um, basically, the, the accounts are, are from people, World Health Organization monitors who are trying to find these people. And that if they didn't see one in five or one in 10 variolations did, didn't work, they'd have to redo this, okay? So they were really looking for, if this is, if they did a good job, lots of these kids are gonna get very sick and some would die, okay? And they could monitor this either by the, in, you know, looking at the site of injection or sort of how the patient progressed. Okay, so what's the drawbacks? Well, it is the death rate from variolation, depending on um, the different um, estimates, death rate from smallpox is up to 50%. Typically it's around 20 to 30% can decimate an entire town or village at that way at that rate. The death rate from variolation is much smaller. So uh, typically you would have a couple of, of kids would die, but it was nowhere 20 to 30%, it was one to 2%, okay? So although it prevented many deaths, if it's your kid, you're unlikely to want to be the one to do this. The other problem with this is that you can never clear that pathogen from the world. 
because what you're doing is, in, is intentionally propagating it, okay? So you can never eradicate it. And then also, in order for you to do, go to the next village, you have to take scabs from the first village. So you're carrying those with you. Okay, so there's a couple questions. Uh, I think I answered the prophylaxis one. That's just prophylaxis is before you get exposed. Post-exposure prophylaxis is after you got exposed. The second question is if you get bit by a rattlesnake, again, after treatment, would you be immune? Yes, you certainly are still gonna make an immune response against the venom. Question is how come it is not as expensive to get your dog immunized if they get bit by a rattlesnake? And the main answer is it doesn't have to be FDA grade. There's a diff big, huge difference in cost between a, something you're gonna use to treat an animal versus something that you're gonna use to treat a human. Dr. Blatton? Yes. Have they tried variolation, but using a more effective way to kill all of the pathogen, like if they actually increase the UV exposure and then inoculated a patient? It's a double-edged sword. If you completely inactivate it, it doesn't work. So you need it to remain, have some ineffectivity. Um, Dr. Blatman? Yes. Has any um, of the groups working on COVID um, therapy, like have they tried the horse serum that you were talking about earlier, like antibodies from the horse serum? Yeah, they're actually taking convalescent serum from humans to transfer to other humans. And it has been tried, not in a huge clinical trial, but it, uh, there is, it, it hasn't been terribly promising mainly because COVID-19 has spread so fast that you're, you're taking a patient who's already at the height of disease and transferring serum into them, it's not likely to have much of an effect at that point. But it, it, it is being done, okay? So this is actually, was the impetus for driving, well, we needed a safer vaccine and so, was really, and this was driven in part by the United States, where it was sort of at a time where we were starting to reject all things British. And we somehow adopted vaccination, which is immunization, or just vaccinating with something that's closely related to smallpox, but still provides immunity. And this is one of the early sort of um, propaganda posters, right, against saying vaccination is better than variolation. So over here are, uh, obviously this is drawn as the British, we're kicking them out and, and these are the variolationists. Now notice what they have are big knives with lots of blood on them, okay? And that's the variolation is injecting with live actual smallpox. And on the other hand, we have the saintly Americans, right? That have smaller knives that don't have as much blood on them, okay? And this is, so you can, if you have the download the slides, you can go through and read these. It, really they're saying, oh, it's just corporate greed that you're trying to do this and we've got a better way. My favorite part though, is the guy in the back. If you can't read it, it says, surely the disorder, the disorder of the cow is preferable to that of the ass. And so there is snarkiness even back in the, in the mid 1700s. So vaccination is typically uh, credited to Edward Jenner, okay? Where he's typically the one who's given credit for administration of the first formal vaccine, which was vaccine, uh, against vaccinia virus, right? Or sorry, vaccinia virus against variola virus. And so vaccinia is, is not actually cowpox, but it's, it's isolated from cows and it's given as a vaccine against smallpox. Now, in reality, there's at least three recorded instances of people doing this before Jenner, okay? And so John Fester, who was a country doctor, had the same observations. There's some argument that Jenner sort of stole his notes and did this. But then there were two farmers, uh, Jobs DeBose and Benjamin Jesty, who also did it, but they really had no idea what they were doing and they weren't doctors, so they didn't write it up or sort of report it. The reason that Jenner is given credit is mainly because 
He was a member of the Royal College of Surgeons. He was, had some influence. And even with, from him, it was really, uh, it was hotly contested because variolation was a industry, right? It was the, the medical industry was, we can prevent this and it's already ingrained. And if you replace it with something else, uh, lots of people are gonna lose their job. But we now know it's much safer and much better way of doing it. Okay, so vaccine virus, which is not smallpox, it's cowpox, it's closely related, uh, well, it's closely related to cowpox, replicates inefficiently in humans, but it does induce cross-protective immunity, mainly antibodies to smallpox. And so this was used to eradicate smallpox from the planet. We haven't had a smallpox plant infection on earth since 1977. And that distinction goes to this poor guy, Ali Mao Malin, probably murdering his name. Um, but he was the last case of naturally acquired smallpox. There's been some exposures in the lab. We're not counting those. But really, this was the last smallpox um, incident. And this is, you know, 43 years ago. So how did this work? Okay, well, we have to sort of take in some ugly truths here. The early smallpox vaccines, essentially they would make, take a razor blade and, and make slits on the side of a cow and then rub the scabs into that. And then, then once those, the, cow, the cow made responses to that, they would then start um, harvesting those scabs. And then essentially what you're doing is growing up more scabs on the cow you dissolve them in PBS, you purify them by filtration to remove all the cow hairs and, and other debris. And that was your vaccine. Okay, that sounds barbaric, right, by modern methods. Now what we do is we grow vaccinia virus in cell culture, purify it by density gradient and in clean rooms. And so it's, it's a, a much cleaner and sort of ethically sourced. Um, and, but the actual injection, most of you have never gotten a smallpox vaccine. You have to be sort of older like me or have a special reason for doing that like me where you work with some vaccine viruses. But essentially they take that vaccine, and they dip a needle, a bifurcated needle into it and then they jab you in the arm. It's really not any different than what the variolationists used to do. We would just dip the needle into some scab uh, scab dust and, and jab you. And it's very imprecise. The number of jabs depends on your rapport with the nurse, um, sort of how they were trained, you know, can be very different. I think at ASU, I've, I've had it done to me. They do at least 20, <laughs> 20 it, to 30. <laughs> it, it depends on the nurse. I've seen <laughs> as few as one, and I've heard people saying many, like, a, upwards in the teens. I did have a question because some of our lab mates, they can't get the vaccine, this vaccine because of um, eczema. Yeah. So if they, if somebody did, didn't know that they have eczema or they didn't think it would be a big deal, if they did get this vaccine, could they potentially be spreading that in the areas that they do have eczema? No, the vaccine that we use for vaccine uh, va va for smallpox now is actually attenuated, doesn't replicate in most people. However, mm -hmm. if you look at and leads directly into the next slide is that it is not completely 100% safe, right? People with some pre-existing conditions like eczema or underlying uh, immune deficiencies can have develop pretty severe disease. And so this is what the, the response typically looks like, it's not always quite that big, but you have at the site of injection, you develop a scab, it, it's kind of painful for a few days, it swells up. That's pretty typical. This is a live virus. It has the potential to cause some disease. And, and you, most of these pictures are from years ago when we used a more virulent strain of the vaccine virus. But this is progressive vaccinia where the site you can see that you didn't have a little scab, you got a big scab and develop sort of permanent damage there. Uh, if you have eczema, you can develop very serious reactions that are not at the site of infection, or you can develop sort of a vaccinia-like disease where you, it's particularly in exposure in young kids, 
where they actually get vaccinia disease. Now, all of these are typically not lethal. I mean, all of these patients actually recovered. And so it sucks and it can cause some damage, but it's not typically going to kill you. But for those of you who see the anti-vaccine sort of propaganda, it's not new. Okay, this is sort of some of the earliest propaganda against smallpox, against vaccinia as a vaccination against smallpox was that, oh, it's from cows. And so if you inject it, here you can see, here's the doctor. He's uh, basically giving you the vaccine. He's sticking you with a cow vaccine. You can see all these people are either turning into a cow, you know, cows coming out of their mouths or other places. And the idea is that they're trying to create fear about this. Well, we now know that this is a much safer procedure than giving the variola virus, the actual live smallpox. Okay, vaccination is much safer. I just want to show you the vaccine propaganda, anti-vaccine propaganda is not new by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, so when, then we go sort of, that was, Variolation was just the wild type pathogen. Vaccination is a pretty closely related one, but you don't always have that option. And so the next best thing would be to take the wild type pathogen and make it less or make it weaker, make it not grow as well, make it lose genes that are important for virulence. And so in general, what you do is you'll take some pathogen, here we have an adenovirus, and you put it into a different species. And you passage that many times in the species, meaning you infect it, then you harvest it, infect another of that same species, harvest that, and keep doing that until it becomes adapted to grow in that species. And then when it's doing that, now it's no longer adapted to humans. Okay, so it's, it's uh, adapted to a different species, doesn't grow as well in humans. You can also do this by passaging it in cell lines that are permissive. And so what, what happens there is that it starts to lose genes that it would normally require to, um, to evade the immune system or um, cause disease in the human. And so you just keep passaging in cells until it loses those genes. Then you isolate Dr. Bobbin, it. Yes. Uh, when do you know, like in this scenario, um, that the pathogen has been changed enough or attenuated? I mean, the short answer is you don't. You don't know until you start doing phase one clinical trials, which are just safety. <laughs> Other than that, there's not a good answer. Okay, thanks. Okay, so you pick this, you, you sequence it or do whatever you want to do it, and you get an attenuated vaccine. This is actually what's done for what was originally done for measles virus. We didn't even know why it was attenuated. We just knew that it didn't grow as well in culture, and so we could inject it in humans and it worked pretty well. Now we actually do know a bit more about it. Um, but in general, what you're trying to do is get it to, to either adapt to a different species, so it's no longer adapted to you, or put it in cells where it loses its, its virulence genes. And so now it's safer for you. Okay, so historically, we didn't know why many of the vaccines worked or how they were attenuated. We just knew that they were. And, but now we, we sort of, gone beyond that. When you look at current, your vaccine schedule, this is just a partial vaccine schedule. It's nowhere near comprehensive, but you can see that there are a number of attenuated vaccines. Rotavirus, there's an attenuated influenza virus, attenuated measles, attenuated hep A, and you can get all of those. Okay, so there's, there's some part of vaccines are actually are live attenuated vaccines, okay? And there are other ones that I haven't listed here. Do you need to memorize these? No, I'm not gonna ask you what the vaccine schedule is. Okay, so when we're talking about this is now safer, we've intentionally taken something and even for vaccine virus against smallpox, we've attenuated that. And so the complications rate right, the chances of you getting some disease outcome from getting a vaccine are very low. For common ones like the MMR, most measles and rubella, then it's one in a million. And the deaths are less than one in 10 million. So very low percentage. 
or things like yellow fever virus, which most people don't get. Army recruits and people going to tropical places will get it. It's, it's still one in 100,000 will have a reaction, but the death rate is very low. Uh, live polio, there can be a number of reactions, right? It's one in a thousand can develop some symptoms following injection, but the death rate you can see for these is still very, very low. And these are even further reduced by pre-screening people for contraindications, things that say you shouldn't get this vaccine. If you have allergies or on immunity, you're immune compromised, you have pre-existing conditions, excuse me, but anybody who says they're completely safe is wrong. And I'm not gonna tell you that here either. I actually was contacted when I was at the University of Washington for somebody, a patient who died of the yellow fever virus vaccine, okay? There's other things where um, th that are, there are incidents of when something happens. Um, with the oral polio virus, there was about one in 2 million of the vaccine or vaccinees develop paralytic polio. And it wasn't clear how this happened, but it's thought that it's the parent, it's passaging through the infant, parent changes the diaper, they contract the polio from the feces, and then they spread it to some other site. So then you've actually made a virulent polio by injecting the kid with the attenuated version. There's also cases where, for example, the influenza virus and specifically the, the virus, the vaccine that was used in the mid seventies, people started developing Guillain-Barre syndrome. Okay, it was about one in a hundred thousand. Why? We still don't know to this day why, but that specific vaccine caused problems. Okay, so live attenuated are safer, but they're not hundred percent safe. They're just close. Okay, so now we have really wild type uh, pathogen, a related pathogen, and attenuated pathogen. Those are the different, different problems. Now, these things we group together because the main benefit is that the biology of the vaccine is similar or identical in the case of the wild type to the wild type pathogen. And so generally, you're gonna get the right kind of immune response or a protective immune response. The main drawback for these is really safety. There are you know, we've gone to much safer versions, but they still have the potential to cause disease on their own. The other problem is that you can't do this for some things. The potential for reversion to the wild type pathogen for things that are lethal is too high for you to use an attenuated version. So you can't make an attenuated HIV and expect that that's gonna be any way useful because if it reverts to the wild type, you've just infected everybody with HIV. So you can't do it. So what do we do? Well, the thing that we'll do then is to use recombinant vectors. This is where you take something that's already a, vi a vaccine, for example, a adenovirus that we already know um, that, that it works as a vector or something that can carry parts of another virus. And you insert the uh, hemagglutinin protein from influenza into the genome of that adenovirus. And now the adenovirus is expressing the, hemo the flu hemagglutin protein. Now, why do we do this? Well, we already know this is safe. And so we're just expressing something foreign to this adenovirus. And so it's a, it's a uh, flu vaccine. Now, I'm not gonna cover all the molecular biology about how you do this, how you cut the gene and put it into a different, um, different host. But in generally, this works pretty well because you get two vaccines for the price of one. Most recombinant vectors are still in research level. They're not in clinical use, but there's a few. The advantage of this is you get two vaccines for the price of one. You get a vaccine against the adenovirus and you get a vaccine against the influenza virus. Okay, so you get one against this, uh, proteins from adenovirus and uh, immune response against the proteins from influenza virus. So this was tried as a vaccine for, for HIV. And it's the only case where there was some protection observed um, for HIV. And this was in the uh, RV144 Thailand vaccine trial. 
was conducted by the US military. And you can see that people who got the vaccine had a lower incidence rates of HIV infection. Now the recombinant pox, the recombinant uh, vector in this case was a canary pox virus that was expressing HIV proteins. And there was some, there was some efficacy, it's roughly about a 30% efficacy, but to get that, they had to play around with the statistics. At the very best, it's about 30%. It's likely not really much of production at all. Uh, but we'll cover that when we talk about HIV. So you use this for things that you can't just make an attenuated version for. If you're following the, um, some of the COVID-19 vaccines, a lot of them are using recombinant uh, DNA or RNA. The Moderna, Moderna vaccine is just COVID-19 RNA that they're injecting into, the, into patients to see if they develop an immune response to it. So there's a lot of ways you can deliver this, but essentially you're just taking a gene from whatever pathogen you're interested in, let's say it's COVID-19. You put that into a plasmid or if it's RNA, you just directly inject it. And you now you have a plasmid that is expressing or that can express that gene. And you put it into, you inject it into human. The olden days they used a gene gun, which was injecting gold particles covered with these plasmids. Now we just use a syringe. You can also use electroporation. It is taken up by cells and they start expressing that pathogen protein. So this is a very easy way to make a vaccine. This is the cheapest vaccine that you can ever make, but it's, and it's very stable, right? DNA is pretty stable. And so it's an ideal thing for targeting diseases that are prevalent in, in remote populations. Okay, but it's also not great. Recombinant vaccines are very safe. They're safer than attenuated. And often what they are is actually attenuated vaccines that have inserted another gene into them. And they can be useful for other things like gene therapy. They're very easy, cheap, stable. So they're really, um, really great for a number of purposes. But the main drawback is now the biology of the vector and the pathogen may not match at all. If you're injecting RNA, that's not the same as getting infected with a virus. Okay, so it's a totally different biology and you often can get the wrong kind of immune response. The second problem is you can have pre-existing immunity to the vector. Okay, so if you have, if you're getting an adenovirus vector, many of us are already immune to adenovirus because it's in the population and that prevents you from making much of a response to whatever's inserted into it. So it's, pre-existing immunity is actually a big problem with, with recombinant vaccines. So then we move to killed vaccines. Okay, and a lot of what you see now are killed vaccines or subunit vaccines, which are just part of the, of the pathogen. Killed vaccines are usually irradiated, heat inactivated, formalin fixed, it's any way you can just kill something. Usually subunit vaccines are produced, they're just proteins from that uh, pathogen that are produced in cell culture and then purified. But they're, we've grouped them together because they kind of do the same thing. You're just injecting something that's dead and it's, not, it's gonna be seen by the immune system that way. So there's a couple of examples of that. And some of the first ones are, are just carbohydrate vaccines. And so pneumovax, pneumococcal vaccine, um, is it just against some polysaccharides? And you can, from what you know of immunology, you can guess that that's not gonna be terribly successful because you need a protein component to engage the T cells so they can provide B cell help and give you, you know, all of those things that we talked about, um, somatic hypermutation, isotype switching, affinity maturation. Those don't happen without a T cell component. So it didn't work um, most, of the, most of the time, it just didn't work. In 1977, they made a 14 valent vaccine that essentially they started getting responses to something in the 80s, they made a 23 valent. It's still is going up. And this is basically you're trying to get some antibodies, but they're not very good. Now we have uh, the same thing, but it's Prevnar. And it is a, it's the same thing. Uh, it's got seven, seven serotypes of pneumococcus, but it's conjugated to a protein. 
So now you can engage the T cell response. Okay, so these are just a subunit vaccine where you're expressing these different, um, different pneumococcus proteins or different pneumococcus uh, polysaccharides onto a protein carrier. This is also true for the hepatitis B vaccine, okay, where you're taking the gene, the hepatitis B uh, surface antigen, you're producing it in cells, producing that protein in cells, you purify it, and there you go, that's your vaccine. Um, it can also be something a little more complex, it can be virus-like particles. So in this case, you take the genome of uh, hepatitis of uh, human papillomavirus, you grow it up in cell culture, but then you purify the virus-like particles, which are called that because they don't have any genetic material in them. And I'm not gonna ask you how you do all these steps. Just know that a virus-like particle is all the protein and none of the genetic material. So you inject it, it's still dead. It's not going to replicate. So killed vaccines or subunit vaccines are, are the main benefit is they're very safe to administer. There's no potential for disease because it's dead. Can't do anything. And it's easy to make, right? You just dump it in some formalin, kill it, and then it, there you go. The main drawback is that the biology of the vector and the pathogens are, are absolutely different. The pathogen can replicate. Something is dead is dead. And so you often get the wrong types of immune responses. And this was seen in a clinical trial in the late 60s at our height of our vaccine making arrogance, where we took respiratory syncytial virus, which normally just causes a sniffling disease. We formal infixed it and then vaccinated a bunch of kids. And so what happened is that first year when you did the vaccination, everything was fine. But the next year when RSV came through that those schools, you had much higher hospitalization rates. Some of the kids died. Um, and it was really thought that the vaccine elicited the wrong kind of immune response. And instead of a protective Th1 bias response, you got a, a non-protective Th2 response, which actually made disease worse. And this was actually seen in the last couple of years in uh, Southeast Asia with a dengue virus vaccine, which it, actually caused, uh, the, it caused antibodies in the vaccine, vaccinated high schoolers. Those antibodies actually facilitated dengue infection rather than prevent it. And then there, there were actually a lot of student deaths. And the main problem was that they never consented these kids. The parents were not informed. They just did it to all the high schoolers. So now the, the leaders of that vaccine trial are actually being brought up on war crime charges. You might be surprised to know, same vaccine is currently going into Brazil. But they're saying, well, it's only going to be used in people who have already had dengue. Well, if they've already had dengue, why do they need your vaccine? It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it does still happen even right now. Okay, so in the last few minutes here, let's talk about the propaganda of vaccines. And my position on this is that we cannot ignore that vaccines have a downside. They're extremely efficient at protecting us from diseases, but anybody who comes to you and says, there's no chance of something bad happening is lying. But to understand how to make a better vaccine, we have to understand what the downsides are. So early anti-vaccine propaganda really was saying, was basically saying that the industry, the, the, the country is going to lose many, uh, many jobs and this is an industry, you just can't change it. So like the coal industry now saying, well, we're, we're so committed to coal, we can't do renewable energy. Well, there's no reason we can't change, okay? If it's a better way, we should do it. Now, this really became a problem. There's a number of these where they're basically, you know, we get people to write these things about how vaccination ruined their lives, okay? And, agree, and, and this actually ended up in the Supreme Court saying, does an individual have the right to not be vaccinated? And the Supreme Court even many years ago said, no, the rights of the uh, community outweigh the rights of that individual. And so this is a debate that's still going on and I'm not going to say which side is right because I'm certainly not gonna say you don't have any rights. But increasingly government said, no, 
In order for us to control disease, we need to have mandatory vaccination, which is why in order to attend ASU, you have to show proof of your vaccinations. And a lot of this was fueled by this early propaganda, right? And this isn't new. This is, here's our evil demon doctors. They have horns and a tail here, dumping all the babies into this demon cow. And here you see all the pox on the side of the cow. And then it's, it is uh, defecating out the children uh, that are now dead. And we're just loading those into a wagon and taking them off to, to uh, the graveyard. Okay, that's really anti-vaccine propaganda is based on fear, but we can't do that. It doesn't look any different than now, right? This is just a few years ago, this was an anti-vaccine ad and it's, and they're saying it includes all of these things, mercury and formaldehyde and, and aluminum phosphate, which is alum, and includes bovine fetal serum. Oh my gosh, what is that? And you can see, here's the doctor with his scabby hands, no gloves, all these children are being forced and they're very unhappy about it. Anybody who's been to a pediatrician says that that's not the case, but it's just feeding on fear. Okay, so this isn't new. And it's being fed by some misconceptions, right? If you look down here, well, it includes all, the vaccine includes all of these nasty things, but they completely ignore dose dependence effects. So that brings us to the, some of the main arguments against vaccination. And the first is perhaps most famously is the Andrew Wakefield argument where he was a gastroenterologist and dean in, in the UK. And he was trying to make a, a correlation between incidences of autism and um, MMR vaccination. Okay, now, this paper has been retracted because it was clearly shown to be false. Um, it was faked data. And also you can't actually diagnose patients with autism at that age. And they were actually incorrectly diagnosed in five out of six patients. And it was thought that he was, or was proven that he intentionally faked the results. What people, many people don't realize is Andrew Wakefield actually had invested in an alternative MMR vaccine that you, he had a conflict of interest that he didn't disclose. It was, he was invested in an alternative to the current version. They also did you know, invalid statistical analysis, right? You can look at any correlation. This is organic food sales and autism, and they correlate nearly perfectly. Am I saying that autism causes or our organic food causes autism? No, but you, can, you can't just say correlation. Uh, is causation. So that's the first part. The second or the fourth reason that this really got blown up is that Wakefield didn't back, up, back down. He could have easily just said, you know what, I was wrong. I apologize and gone on with his life. But he didn't. He backed down. He escalated this. And so he didn't get any favors from the media. And eventually his license was taken away and all of his, his credentials is no longer a doctor. He continues to speak on this and argue that they do in fact cause autism, but he's wrong. There have been thousands of studies since that time, zero show, show any cause and effect between the vaccine and autism. Now the second argument, which is that the vaccine cause autism is a different thing. It's actually saying that there's a component of the vaccine, thimerosal, which is a mercury component, um, which is a preservative. And, they, and people say, well, there's mercury in the vaccine that's causing autism. People who say that clearly don't understand the difference between metal mercury, elemental mercury, and mercury ions, which act very differently, right? But in any case, so what happened was the FDA said, okay, in the, in the early 80s said, we'll take out thimerosal. We'll take out the mercury and nothing changed. Okay, there was no change in autism rates when thimerosal was taken out. And then they said, well, we'll put it back in. There was, again, no change in autism rates after they added it back in. And so this, but the fact that the FDA re recommended removing it was taken by general public as admission that mercury ions caused autism. Okay, but it didn't. And now all current vaccines have thimerosal free formulations available. So you can't use that argument anymore. 
but people continue to believe there's a link, right? This is a church in Texas where the, the uh, it's actually, she's the pastor, I believe, uh, where they said, no, this is not, this is against God. Then they had a measles outbreak there. And they said, okay, we're just kidding. God wants you to get vaccinated. So wherever you lie on the spectrum, this is just for you to be able to talk about what are the different um, arguments for and against vaccination. Uh, we're almost at the end here. So the last thing is with COVID-19, they're talking a lot about herd immunity, okay? And it's important to understand what that is. And vaccination doesn't have to be 100% of the population vaccinated in order to be effective. Most pathogens have a critical value. We talked about the or not value. Or Sorry, I guess that was in a different lecture. Most pathogens have a critical value of immunized individuals that if certain uh, threshold is exceeded, the, the virus doesn't spread anymore, okay? And you realize what's, it's people who don't vaccinate have to rely on people who are vaccinated to prevent them from getting infection. In the COVID-19 argument, you're basically saying, we're gonna let the virus spread and eventually enough people will become immune that it won't spread anymore. That's a terrible idea because you're still gonna have the death rate. Okay, so that's not going to be a good solution. And this is, this is herd immunity is typically thought of for vaccination, not for just letting it spread in the population. That's a bad idea. Okay, so what do I want you to know? Well, for these sections, I really want you to be able to tell me, for the things we've covered, what are they? What is passive immunization? When does it naturally occur? Well, how does it differ if you're giving antibodies versus T cells? And What's the goods and the bads of that? And then what are the different types of active vaccines? Starting from wild type pathogen to related to attenuated to recombinants. And what are the pros and cons of each of those different vaccine strategies? And then what is the argument in the vaccine versus autism debate? Okay. So I'm gonna end there and the bonus question this time is a little different. So it's going to take a little bit of research. Okay, I want you to describe any of the currently being developed SARS-CoV-2 or otherwise known as COVID-19 vaccines. Um, being developed, being developed, whatever, excuse my grammar. And I, what I want you to tell me, what is the vaccine? Which of the, those groups of vac active vaccines does it fall into? Or if it's a passive vaccine, what is it? What are the advantages of that approach and what are the disadvantages, right? If you're talking about the convalescent serum, that's passive antibody transfer. So that's passive immunization. It's fairly safe, um, right? And it has the potential to treat somebody who's already infected. The disadvantage of it is it's short-lived, it's expensive, and you're only treating people who are actually infected. Okay, so that's sort of what I'm looking for here. And I'll stop there and take questions. Dr. Patman? Yes. So a few weeks ago, I was the only one in my family who chose to get the nasal version of the, the, the flu mist vaccine mm -hmm. instead of the um, injection type of vaccine. And I was also the only one in my family who developed flu-like symptoms about two days after I got that. Um, why would that be that I got symptoms and everyone else in my family who got the shot version didn't? Well, first of all, the shot version is dead. It's, it's not actually, um, it's the main, the answer to your question is flu mist is attenuated. Uh, if I'm recalling this directory directly, the, the flu mist versions, all of the nasal spray flu vaccines are actually attenuated viruses, but they're mm -hmm. still replicated. They can still replicate. Mm -hmm. The shots, most of the shots are just dead, uh, dead virus. So okay. it's grown, it, the, the influenza is grown, there's no genetic material there, so it can't replicate. Mm -hmm. In the long term, we don't know which is going to be better, but it's likely you, if you have got the live replicating virus, then you probably have higher levels of immunity. 
How do you know if you got the the shot version and it's a dead virus? How do you know if your immune system was activated against it? Well, you could you could go and look for antibodies against it, mm -hmm. but typically we don't do that. We just look for at population level are people protected or not protected. Okay. I just thought it was str I just thought it was interesting. I, I'm the only one who chickened out because I didn't want to get a shot, and <laughs> of course I was the one who got <laughs> symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, but well, if you think about it, that makes sense because if you're delivering it by a spray, how's it going to get in? It has to have some strategy for getting into the system mm -hmm. to stimulate the immune system. Well, it's got to be a live thing then. So what did it go in? Did it go through your respiratory system or mm -hmm. like? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Off the respiratory tract. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Blattman, I must have just missed this at some point. Is our final on the last day of class now? Yes, it is. Okay, I'm going to have to email you about this, but all of my finals got moved to the last day of class, and there I have back-to-back -back classes, and I'm right. also a DRC student, and I can't take three finals at the exact same time. Right. I am aware that there are a lot of students in that predicament, because we are all all of the people who would normally space out those finals were told we have to have it all on the same yeah. last day. I'm sure we're all cranky about that, but also. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I can tell you that the final will, again will be open book, open notes. And in this part of the lectures, typically students do much better on the final than they do on other parts of the class because it's more about just applying the same thing over and over again. So. And another way of saying that is that the final is actually easier than the midterms in this class. Well, I, I'm so glad to know that. Although I wouldn't, I wouldn't typically admit that outside of a class. Dr. You, Butman? Yes. Uh, is it even possible to create herd immunity in the way that they're talking about with COVID-19 with uh, respect to the uh, ability of the virus to mutate in the way that we're starting to learn more about right now? Well, yeah. I mean, it, the way that most viruses are mutating is through getting a replicative advantage. Uh, but things like influenza, where you have both shift and drift and sort of evasion of the immune system, that can happen, but it happens over a longer period of time. So yes, we could develop herd immunity. The problem is in order to do that, you're basically saying, I accept the 3% mortality rate. I'm fine with those people dying. In order to get herd immunity, you have to say that, yes, I'm fine with that 3% dying or whatever the percent is now. It's, it's going down as we get more diagnosis, but that's, and anybody who says, oh, we can just do that. It has to admit that they gotta be okay with the other people dying. There's no way around it. So maybe this is just a myth that I've heard as an RA, but um, I, I've heard so many times that big universities like ours have their own strains of STDs. Is it possible that eventually we would get our own special strain of COVID? Well, okay. So I do give, I do talk about this later in another lecture, but um, Dorms are, are some of the highest plate. The hospitals and dorms have the highest incidence of spread of different diseases. It's a staggering amount, excuse me, of infections for freshman college students, particularly STDs. But um, I don't know about strains. I think that's mostly with a global student population. I don't think that that's really true. Um, and I doubt that, that we would have an ASU specific COVID-19 strain. Okay, good to know. Dr. Blattman? Yes. I, I had a question about um, adjuvants because remember you were talking about the thimerosal and how some people have the argument of like, well, let's just replace the like the mercury and other components. I know they're not in there anymore with different types of adjuvants. What do you think about that? There's only two adjuvants that are approved for use in humans. One is a one is aluminum hydroxide, which is alum, which has been used, which is approved because it's been used historically in 
it stimulates macrophages, but nobody really knows how it's engaging the innate system very well. Um, there's lots of arguments, but nobody's very good at telling that. The other one is a, uh, is a TLR7 agonist. And that's only been recently improved. So that those are your only two options. We <laughs> can't give anything else. Aren't they doing research on this like plant-based adjuvant? I was it in Africa, I think, the QS21? Yeah, there's a number that are being researched and we can use lots of different adjuvants um, in the laboratory, but you can't, there's not, there's only two that's approved in humans. So those are your only two choices. Gotcha. Hi, Professor. Yes. So um, I got an email saying that my exam two grade was changed. Was that supposed to uh, be for our exam three grade or? I will look so into it. I'm, I'm going right now and changing just to the curved points currently. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, for those of you still on, uh, there's a chat question. How often does the incorrect type of immune response happen? We have no idea. Um, <laughs> and it's, it only shows up if there's some very severe adverse effects. Uh, didn't Wakefield also lose his credentials because of this? Yes, he absolutely was. Uh, his, his license was, for medicine was taken away. But that hasn't changed his ability to continue to, to advocate for it. That's frustrating, though, because he's spreading misinformation out there, which is causing people to make wrong decisions. Yeah, you could argue the same thing about some of the current administration's health advisors that are advocating for herd immunity approaches and they're spreading mis misinformation. There's also saying, oh, we have to have a vaccine by, I think today was the deadline, right? Election day? Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. And so it's really leave this, you know, we, you have to understand immunology to understand what you want a vaccine to do and how to get there. And without that, you're just sort of throwing stuff up in the wind. But yeah, there's lots of misinformation out there on vaccines. And there's, uh, I had to stop, um, I had to stop a friend's daughter who was who thought that reading a few articles about vaccines and autism let her be an expert in that field. And it's like, well, you don't even know what you're talking about in terms of the immune system responding to the vaccine. You just are reading biased things. And this is what we do as humans. We're not good as, at assessing risk. So if there's a one in a million chance that, that a vaccine is going to cause a problem, we don't do it because we think, well, what if I'm that one in a million? Well, that's dumb. Right. That's like saying, well, and that's the same reason people buy lottery tickets because we don't understand we're not going to win. On the other hand, we, all, we have this bias of only agreeing with things that we already agree with. And so you go and read biased things and then you agree with them because that was your preconceived conclusion. So it's, this misinformation continues to be out there and it continues to be spread. Okay, well, I'm sorry for keeping you all late uh, and I'll see you on Thursday.